the one, the only, the awesome kick butt Katie Souza. Let's stand and let her know we love her very, very much. Good morning. How many people were here over the weekend? Awesome. That's good church, good church. Okay, um, I normally don't do commercials, but I'll do one a little quick, and that is go to the table. There's not product there, but there's QR codes from the classes that I have built. I've built some really, really good master classes. Uh, I think that if you start taking all the master classes I've done, you're gonna see the realm of miracles and deliverance go from like one to a Mach 10. No, for real, I do. Because I'm just telling you everything that I do. When I'm up here doing stuff, you don't realize I'm, I'm administrating certain ways, I'm teaching certain things, I'm doing certain steps, all for an end game. I have an end game in mind, and the end game is to get everybody in the room delivered and healed. That is my number one focus in life, is that. So I just impart that understanding about administration of miracles and scriptural precepts that lead to that end game in these master classes. Okay, is this superhuman? This is my um, class, my master class called Superhuman. If you were here yesterday, you heard my message on you know, what I built this class off of. There's 11 sessions in this, 11, okay? So you need to do it. If you put your phone up to that QR code, the link will come down and you can um, join the class. Uh, the 11 sessions are not just me teaching, I'm teaching but I'm activating in every single session numerous times. In one session I think we take communion 27 times. And we do decrees and activations and meditations. No, that's not a new age word. We had it first. Um, you know, in every single one, worship after, worship after the sessions. And then there's a th three part Q and A where I answered people's questions. So you're gonna hear other people having their questions and me answering them. And I mean, it's like, it's very intensive stuff. This is definitely something that is, wow, it's 111. <clears throat> Just so that you know. Okay, so definitely need to get that. We have to be, it's, it, it's in time marching orders, like Dave said. We've gotta be ready. And if we're weak, sick, infested with demons, yeah, we've got to be ready, okay, amen? Okay, so now, um, knowing that, let's play a video. We're gonna, I've been playing a lot of metal videos, and I am gonna bring somebody up here and metal wand them in a second. Um, but let's play a video about cancer today, because I know people do have that struggle, and we are seeing a definite escalation on our numbers of cancer being healed when we pray for them because of the strategies God's given us. So uh, let's roll that clip. Ralph Holiday. Ralph? Right, Ralph Holiday. Mr. Ralph. What happened? God made a big change in my life. You know, starting out yesterday, I had been dealing with a uh, prostate problem, prostate cancer, and it was hard for me to go to the bathroom and. I've been waiting to go to an outside doctor for six months now, but they keep giving me medication. And yesterday I was, when I was coming to church, I was kind of hurting. And I almost turned around and went back. But it's just like something in my spirit. And I'll just go ahead on now. And when I got there and before service started, it seemed like, you know, God had everything set just for me. Because when I sit down, even while the guy was coming in, uh, so Sister Katie I said, hey, who got cancer? And guys kept pointing at me, go, go, go. Now, I'm not, I had said the day before, I said, man, I ain't going over there and let no lady lay hands on me, you know. <laughs> and when I got there and when she called, I got up and go up. So we're going to walk through some prayers and you're going to pray with me, okay? Say, Lord God, 
Lord God. I renounce. I renounce all witchcraft. All witchcraft. All idolatry. All idolatry. All serpentry. All serpentry. All plans of the enemy. All plans of the enemy. And my association. And my association. With any of these demonic spirits. With any of these demonic spirits. In my lifetime. In my lifetime. And in my bloodline. And in my bloodline. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. You are judging these spirits. You are judging these spirits. On my behalf. On my behalf. Because I'm under grace. Because I'm under grace. And not the law. And not the law. Where we're sin increases and abounds. Where sin increases and abounds. Grace super abounds. Grace shall rebound. So your grace is abounding to me now. Your grace is abounding to me now. So no judgment, so no judgment can be brought against me. Can be brought against by any demonic accusation. By any demonic accusation. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I decree. And I decree. My soul. My soul is filled. Is filled with the Holy Spirit with power. With the Holy Spirit and power. And I am healed. And I am healed. I am excellent soul. And excellent soul. And I am prospered. And I prospered. And brought into Hell, even as my soul prospers, as my soul prospers. In, the in the name of Jesus, I'll stay right there. And when she began to lay hands on me, I just felt like on the inside, like something just burst. And it wasn't no painful thing. You know, it was just like a, a feeling, you know, like a balloon burst and water just go everywhere. I just felt something burst and I just... It was the spirit, I guess, just moved in. Change. How can you tell something changed? How you feel it? You can feel it? What do you feel? What do you feel? I feel relief. You feel relief? Yes, I do. I feel relief. It's not as tight? No. Not How? like it was when I come in. How much between one and a hundred? Oh, God had healed my body. I know this. He had healed me from that disease. You know, I hear people talk about the Holy Ghost. But until you get it, you'll never know what it's all about. <laughs> Ooh, until you get it, you'll never know. And I thank God last night. Mm. Sister Katie, she just don't know. She just don't know how God is using her. 
You know, I know it was God. I know it just wasn't her, but it was her faith, her belief that God worked through. And I thank God for her. And I know God is real, because I can feel him. When he came in, uh, before I prayed for him, he was walking very slowly, and he said it hurt to walk. That's why the running is so important. He's, I'm just, I don't know if, well, we're online, so better watch out. But he said my private areas, that's not what he said, are so swollen I can barely walk. There he was, running. He'd be running. Amen. We're seeing a lot of cancers being healed. It's very amazing. I love it. But it's a strategy. See, a lot of people are just praying, Father, oh, in the name of Jesus, I, I command those cancer cells to die in Jesus' name, and, and then nothing happens. You have to administrate a miracle. It happens in a certain order. That's why you have to take the master classes, because you have to go in a certain order in order to get things to break. And you have to have the biblical understanding behind that order and why it's so important. That's why I always do, I mean, people think sometimes I preach the same messages. I come in on the first day and I go after the soul. That's because nothing is gonna move until that's taken care of. That's part of the administrative order. People's bodies will not let go of metal. They will actually... Your body will actually cling to that cancer, to that metal, to that implant until the trauma is gone. Did you hear what I said? I just gave you a huge key to working miracles. Honestly, the body will not let go of it. It clings on it because it's so traumatized. It will hold on to that. There's an order. One time Tony Kemp told me, you know what's more important than power? I said, what? He goes, administration. Well, that's not what I'm teaching on this morning, but can I have Tomas and his beautiful wife come up here for a minute? Can we give him a hand as they come up? Can I have the detector? So yesterday we did have quite a few metal miracles, quite a few miracles, including a woman who was here in a wheelchair with MS, or they think it's MS. Um, Right away, she couldn't move this foot at all. And right away, she could move it like this. And then within another 30 minutes, she could, she could only lift her leg that high, and she could lift it this high. She's getting healed. <laughs> She's going to come out of that chair and out of that paralysis. Hi, guys. Tell everybody who you are in case they don't know. I'm Tomas. I'm Christina. Tomas had a miracle yesterday. Look at you shiny people. You look so good today. Tell us what happened all those years back. Well, um, I'll start off with this, is that I just want to give God all the glory. Um, I was 12 years old, and I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And um, it was a drive-by shooting. And I ended up getting hit with the bullet and holding on to this bullet for like 41 years until yesterday. It's been 41 years I've had this bullet in me. And uh, Friday, she... Can I add, too, that you never told anyone. Tell that part, would you? <laughs> I never told anybody because of the simple reason it was a, a, a thing that happens. And you just don't go around and spread that stuff the way I grew up. You know, you hold on to things like that because of the investigations or just the, um, uh, the percussions that can come from things like that, growing up like that. So um, I held on to it. I never told my parents. I never told my brothers, my siblings, nobody. Um, I told my wife when we first got together and um, showed her and everything. And I, I just held on to that for 41 years, you know. And um, Katie showed a video on Friday morning when she was, um, and it was a gal that was in prison and she had a bullet. And it was a miracle there. The girl, the, the, the bullet was gone. 
And I, t- I asked God, I said, why not me? Why not now? And he told me, he says, you have to forgive the person that shot that gun because if you don't forgive, then you can't move forward. I don't know who shot the gun. I, I, I really don't know who shot that gun today, that day. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I went home, and on my way home, I, I forgave that person. And God told me to contend for that. Why not you? Why not now? Why not me? So that night, um, I woke up in the morning on on Saturday morning, and I told my wife, hey, I had a dream. She goes, what was the dream? I said, "Um, the Lord told me in the dream that before Katie Souza starts ministering, that bullet will be gone. So yesterday, before she started ministering, I felt this hot sensation on my leg, like burning sensation. And I was on my way to the bathroom because I didn't know what was going on. I just ran to the bathroom. I I, I got stopped by a a, a lady on on that side. She stopped me, and I said, sorry, but I have to go to the bathroom. (laughs) And um, so I went to the bathroom. I pulled my pants down, and I started feeling this heat, the heat on my leg. And I started rubbing my leg trying to find the bullet, and it was gone. It dissolved. I don't know where it went. I came out of the bathroom. I was in tears, and I I see my mama, Cheryl, and I looked at her, and she goes, is it gone? I said, yes. She goes, get up there. Get up there. So I think when we contend for things, guys, in our lives, and we ask for forgiveness for things that we've done or things that have happened, you know, the Lord always reminds me of something, and it and it. And it tells me, you know, it says, never be a prisoner of your past. It's a life lesson, not a life sentence. So if you have something, contend for it. Because why not now? Why not us? You know? Thank you. You're welcome. Now, you've, you've felt a bullet before. Yeah. He, it was tender, and he didn't appreciate it. I didn't mean to. I just remember not to touch it again. <laughs> it's like, honey, I know you're grabbing me by the butt right now, but can you skip the bullet groping? Okay. <laughs> that was probably TMI. Big time. Um, you went and looked at it last night then. Before, could you see the bullet or could you just feel the bullet? Could you see a scar? What, what, what did it look like? I can see the scar right where it went in. And when I would touch it, he would let me now, <laughs> um, it, there was no tenderness at all. And my thumb kind of sunk in where it used to be. I said, it's right, it used to be right here. I can feel it. There's an indent there. So there's actually like an indentation, like a hole, because now the bullet's not there anymore. Yep. <laughs> okay, let's see. Ready? Uh, does anybody have a metal hip? A metal hip. Come up here, please, quickly. I can't move that fast. We'll have to take care of that, huh? All right. Okay, what side is the... All right, just to prove this goes through skin. Just so in case you think it doesn't go through skin. Thank you, I'll pray for you later. Okay. Okay, flip around. Now, I need you to pull your pants up as high as you can. Make sure you don't have your phone in your pocket because, okay, can you put your hand over that rivet? The rivet right there. Okay, now point where it's at, where it was at. Okay, you ready? Give God a praise, please. <laughs> Lena. Amen. Well, today's preach is kind of connected to metal miracles. 
little bit of um, administration on how to get rid of them. You're not going to believe the connection, but here it is. Ready? Character bents and giants. Let me unpack that statement. How many of you know what a character bent is? A character bent is, is a bend in your character that you lean towards when a difficult situation arises. You know, for women, a lot of times character bents are bitterness. Um, and, and men do it too. You know, like, it, a character bent is more like, it's not like a, a, a slip into a sin. It's more like you, you gravitate towards that particular negative behavior on a regular basis, okay? Like, like I said, when a difficult situation arises and maybe you have a character bent towards anger, right away you go, oh, man, oh. you know what I mean? And it's like, that's chronic though. It's not like just that one time you chronically do that. That's called a bent in your character. You know, character bents are very destructive Character bents are some of the biggest reasons why people get divorced. You know, they, you'll, you'll hear a, a wife or somebody complain about their husband. He was always angry. He was always negative. He, you know, he always treated the children badly. She's describing character bents. It's one thing for somebody to get angry, you know, here, there, whatever, but it's one, another thing for them to get angry all the time or be negative all the time. You know, or be bitter all the time. That's called a bent in your character. It's more than a sin. Your actual, your actual personality is predestined to bend towards that negative, destructive re response. Character bents are responsible for a lot of destruction. You see them happening with businesses and uh, ministries and things like that. People leave a church because the pastor, you know, was uh, mean, just straight out mean. Uh, people leave businesses and jobs because I couldn't work for that guy anymore. Man, he was, he treated people terribly. That's a bent in that person's character. Okay. And I'm going to show you how these bents are actually connected to giant spirits and how that's connected to metal. I want to teach you something big today. And you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to work some metal miracles now. How many people in here have a bent in their character? I want you to shout them out. Like, raise your hand, and I'll point at you, and you shout them out. Go. Frustration? What? Anxiety? What is it? Smoking? That's not a character bent. It's more like an addiction. Okay, let's go back to the character bents. Yes. What? Tiredness? Well, yeah, I guess if you allow yourself to, let's be clear. You can have a physical thing that's happening in your body that can be attached to a character bent. If you always think you're tired, you're going to be tired. So do you understand a character bend is more like a mindset and an emotional reaction? Okay. And seclusion, character bend. Being overwhelmed, if you allow yourself, yes, because you can choose not to be overwhelmed. If you're always feeling overwhelmed, it's become a bent. It has. What else? Rejection. If you always allow yourself to feel rejected all the time in every single situation, in all these different situations, yes, that rejection can become a character bend. You've allowed the rejection you've experienced to bend your character towards always feeling rejected. Revenge. Definite character bend. Sadness, if you allow yourself to feel sad, absolutely character bent. If you're always downcast, why are you downcast, oh my soul? Character bents live in the soul. Born again spirit, they govern, live in your soul and govern your soul. And so they govern thus your reactions and your actions. So yes, sadness. Being critical, 
definitely a character bent. You can choose not to be critical. You can choose to find the gold in people, the gold and the good in a situation. But a lot of people lean or bend towards finding the negative, being critical about a situation. Definitely a character bent. Go. What? Never good enough. Yeah, it's kind of like being critical. It's very similar, right? Very similar. Nothing's ever good enough. I'm never good enough. This is never good enough. It's, that's why I love when the Apostle Paul said, I, 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 I can be content in all things. That's what you call an anti-character bent. When you decide you're just going to be content no matter what heck is going on, right? That is totally a weapon against character bents. I'll take a couple more. Go. Stubbornness is as idolatry. Offense. That's a character bent. What? Self-reliance? I think that's an antitrust thing, but yes, it can cross over. That's when you don't trust in God and you only rely on your own strength. I think it can definitely become a character bent. All right, how many of you are starting to understand what a character bent is? How many of you now realize you have a character bent? Raise your hand really high. Come on, let me see. Good church, thank you. Okay. I had a lot of character bents. Imagine that. I was very angry all the time. Imagine that. Scary Katie was once angry scary Katie. Okay? And I definitely had a, a bent towards bitterness. Angry bitterness. Angry bitterness. Um, even as a leader of the ministry, I can remember being in, you know, meetings on, we would have weekly marketing meetings, business meetings in the ministry, and something would have gone sideways. And I'm a perfectionist. It's like, man, it better be done right. Otherwise, I'm going to be like fighting my own character bent. Nowadays, I give a lot more grace for myself and other people. A lot, a lot, a lot more grace. But back in the day, it was just like, I could feel myself seething in the meeting. As a leader of an international millions of dollars ministry, I'm seething in a meeting. This is like 10 years ago. I, and why did that happen? Why? I just want to know why. I just want to know why. Tell me somebody why. This is me. Can you imagine working for me and be like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. I definitely had a problem with a character bent of bitterness. Now, I can remember having a dream. It was more like a vision. I saw um, these, remember those, those coffee trees? They sat on your counter, and there was these stands with arms, and you hung, you know, you hung cups off of them. Right. So I saw this coffee tree in my vision, and uh, hanging off the arms of this coffee tree were these cups. And on these cups were faces of giants. And I was like, what is that? So I looked up the meaning of coffee, and it means a bitter water. So I was like, God, what, is, what, are, you, what are you trying to say? He goes, you are drinking the bitter water. In fact, you're drinking mugs full of it, and it's attracting giants. So I was like, what? How does that work? I wanted to find the connections between giants and, and, and this bitter water. So uh, there was this guy in town, and I went to see him. And I asked him a question. I said, and what, do, what does bitterness have to do with the giants? And he said, bitterness isn't just a sin. It's more like a bent. He said that to me. It's more like a bent. And I'm like, Okay, so I, I went back home, and I looked up the word bent. Now, I don't know if you guys have this. Um, it's a special uh, translation. It's the DRC in the box, DRC 1752. I don't know if you can go to, like, he's shaking his head. No. Okay, I'm going to read it. All right, and I, I, I had my message all planned for today. <laughs> you know how God fixes you on that one? I woke up and it was like, that's not the message. Okay, so the scriptures aren't going to be as prevalent as um, they normally are. Okay, it says, now there were giants on the earth in those days. For after the sons of God went into the daughters of men and they brought forth children. These are the mighty men of old, men of renown. 
And God, seeing the wickedness of men, was great on the earth, and that all the thoughts of their hearts were bent upon evil at all times. See, something happened when there was an ungodly invasion in the earth. When the fallen watchers came down, and I don't have time to explain this doctrine. I would be shocked if anyone didn't know it by now. Uh, they came down and they, they made it with human women. They took the daughters of men and they, out of those marriages, those unholy, unsanctified marriages, there were giants that were produced. And according to other historical books, these giants actually taught men how to partake of much evil, how to, to do witchcraft, how to, how to worship idols, how to read the stars in the planets and use them for their witchcraft and their ceremonies. Now, these giants taught men how to do evil. And according to, this, to the scriptures, that evil and the wickedness that was brought to the earth, because men didn't know how to do witchcraft. They didn't know how to you know, do astrology. They didn't know how to do idolatry. They were taught. They were taught. And out of that, it says, and men's hearts became bent towards evil. Became bent towards evil. That's what's happened in our soul there has been bending towards wickedness that has happened through our bloodline. You know, if you look up the word iniquity, which is a bloodline issue, which means it's, it's passed down from generation to generation to generation, you see, if you look up the word iniquity in the Bible, it means this, ready? To bend. When iniquity's been in your bloodline for a while, it actually bends your soul, it bends your mind, it bends your emotions towards that negative behavior. Some of you have the same character bent that your parents did and your grandparents. How many of that's true? It's not always the case, but sometimes you are just as bitter as your mom or your grandma. How many people have that? Raise your hand where you see the connection. Because the word iniquity again means to bend. And these iniquities, these bends in our character started with the giants. So as I read that, remember, I saw giants on the cups, faces of giants on the cups as a, of the coffee cups, drinking mugs full of bitterness. And it was connected to the giants. I had a giant spirit on me. I hope that rang in your rang inside of you now because if you have a character bent, I'm telling you right now, if you have a character bent that's controlling your life and you've not been able to shake it and it keeps on popping up, there's a giant behind it. People are like, you know how you, uh, everybody teaches about David and Goliath, but nobody, <laughs> nobody is telling you the truth. Where are these giants on your life? How did they get there? How do you get rid of them? Remember what Jesus said in John 14, 30. The prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me that's in common with him, so he has no power over me. You have stuff in you. That's where these giants are coming from. There's stuff in you that's in common with them so they have power over you. Nobody's talking about this stuff. Yeah, that's what I said, wow. So I said, okay, God, you're such a big shot. Since you know all this stuff, show me somebody in the Bible that had a character bent that was connected to the giants. Right away, he says, King Saul. You wonder why David had to take down Goliath? Because Saul had something in common with the giant. So David had to do it. I'm gonna prove it, right? Ready. Whew. 
The first time Saul is ever mentioned in the Bible is in 1 Samuel 9. The chapter opens with the genealogy of Saul and his bloodline. Remember, the word iniquity means to bend. As I'm reading this, I saw proof that his bloodline was polluted by a Nephilim or giant influence. And it was on his entire family. Now, I don't know, do you have New King James? Awesome. 1 Samuel 9, verse 1. Let's pull it up. Okay. And there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bacharath, the son of Ahath, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. So this is the bloodline. We're going to go to verse 2 in a second, but just keep it up there right now. Now, so Saul's father, because you're going to see next, they're going to mention Saul. Saul's father was a man named Kish. Okay. Now notice what Kish is called. A mighty man of power. What were the giants called in Genesis 6? Mighty men. Kish was a mighty man. A mighty man of power. Same as the giants. There were mighty men in the land in those days. Now, guess what the name Kish means? I, I normally would have a graphic, but I, like I said, God gave this to me in the morning. If you go look up the name Kish in the Hebrew, you notice you're going to find out as you, as you look up the meaning of the name that his name means bent. Yeah, that's what I said. His name means bent. Now, think about it. Wow. Kish's name means bent. He's a mighty man. Now, now look at Saul. Look at Saul. Look at Saul. Remember what happened when he, he didn't do as God told him to do and kill off that king of the Amalekites, Agag of the Amalekites? And what happened? The prophet came, and he gave up, put a judgment against him. He goes, you know what, Saul? You know, are, is obedience better? Is sacrifice better than obedience? He goes, you are rebellious as a witch and as stubborn as an idolater. 1 Samuel 15. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as idolatry. What's rebellion and stubbornness? Character bents. Saul was a man full of character bents. And his father was Kish, whose name means bent. And Kish was a mighty man. And that's what the giants were called. He had mighty men. He had giant in his bloodline. And that caused him to have character bents. And that's why he could not fight Goliath. David had to fight Goliath because he had something in common with the giant. Yes. You, want, you, you wonder why you can't take that thing down. Slinging stones at giants and nothing's happening. Because you've got something in you that's in common with that giant. So that giant has power over you. Now go to the next. Go to. This is just a fun little addition here. This is how cool the scriptures are. Go to verse 2 of 1 Samuel 9. It says. And he, meaning Kish, had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than, among, than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the other people. Gosh, he not only had a giant bent in his personality, he had giant DNA to where he was taller than any other Israelite. Israel people, Israelite people, Jewish people are not that tall. But Saul was very tall. Where did he get his height from? Are you listening to me? Put your hand on your belly. Say, oh God, I need to take down some giants. But I got something in me that's in common with them. I need to get rid of it. But you died, Jesus. So I'd have power over the giants. So I release the power of the cross 
into my soul, into my mind, into my will, into my emotions, to cleanse me with your blood of every evil bent that's inside my character. In the name of Jesus, I decree right now that as I speak and confess my sin, that the power of the cross, that the power of the blood is wiping out those altars, those bents inside my soul that are controlling me and bringing destruction and demonic activity in my life in the name of Jesus. Oh, they're not Jesus. Now I want you to turn to each other. The Bible says, confess ye your sins one to the other and you will be healed. I want you to turn to each other and I want you to share with the person next to you what your character bent is. And if you don't know what it is and you turn to your wife, I'm sure she can help you out. When you share it, I want you to lead each other through repentance. Don't just talk about the bent. I want you to repent of the bent. If you're not talking and looking and sharing with somebody, you're not participating. I need you to participate. Okay, yes, yes. That includes older people also, please. Everyone get involved. Thirty more seconds. Thirty more seconds. Lead each other in repentance, please. Come on, start repenting for that bent. Come on. Thirty more seconds. And I repent for the bent, Lord. I repent. 
Some of you are getting a headache right now because that spirit's kicking back on you. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Okay, get ready, wrap it up. All right, you ready? Okay. All right, I'll tell you a little story. I like to wrap myself out. It's called being real. Before I had that revelation, man, I I told you I had so much bitterness. In the beginning of my ministry, uh, about around 2008, is when I really started, you know, traveling and stuff. I went on a, like, a, man, I, I mean, I, I used to do Katie Sue's events. Katie Sue's events, man, I did the whole event, no other speaker by my, I did it by myself. So I did Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. I did, so I did the four sessions. I took all the offerings by myself. I did all the partner calls by myself. I ministered to thousands of people, laid hands, worked miracles, and all that. And I did that week after week after week. Sometimes I did up to 52 weeks a year of that. So after a while, if you've got a, uh, Bitter bent already, things ain't going to go too well. And I tell you what, the more you have your bent, you let your bent manifest without cutting it off, getting your soul healed, getting rid of that giant, the more it attracts trouble. So I'm telling you what, everything that could go wrong went wrong on every single trip, let me tell you. And, and I would just be like, oh, so done. So done. After about four or five years, so done. Right, I mean, we would go through TSA, and I would get pulled over to get my bag searched and to get a pat down almost every single time we went through TSA. Now, see, the enemy knows our triggers. So when you pat me down, I went to federal prison. I'm not going to be happy. That's going to trigger me. So, you know, they pull me over. That's me at TSA as they're patting me down. Say those words, and I'm like, (sighs) I didn't like it. Okay, then you go on the plane, and I don't know what it is about you, man. But man, the plane bathrooms are nasty, and it's mostly because of you. I'm serious. I mean, don't you got, you've got a thing that is able to aim, aim it. What in the world? I'd be coming out of the bathroom, my, my tennis shoes sticking to the floor, and I'd be like, ah, ah. I remember once going to, up towards the plane, going up to go to the bathroom, just hating every thought of it, right? I would go in, I would go in with a Kleenex so I could open the door, close the door, look at the floor, like lower the seat because y'all don't even know how to lower the seat when you're done and all that, right? So I was going up to the bathroom and here's the stewardess and she sees me coming. She goes, and I was like, she reaches over, she grabs three little bottles of vodka, cracks them open, looks at me, flings the door open and goes, and pours the vodka out on the floor. This tells you that I'm not the only one that had a problem with the bathroom in the plane. I've probably taken almost 6,000 flights or so in my life. And I'm telling you what, after (laughs) you hit 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, you're done. You come out and in your heart, you're cursing, cussing out every man in the plane. Was it you? It was you, wasn't it? I know you. You look guilty. Yeah, it's you. (laughs) All right. We would get to the hotel, you know, two legs later and a long two car rides later. 
Finally get to the hotel at like midnight or something. Oh, your room's not ready. <sighs> Trying to be a Christian after you've been a, you know, a terrorist on the street for your entire life is really hard. Especially you got a character bent. Then we had this thing that we called the curse of the key. Every single time, I'm telling you, it's like a magnet. Character bents are like a magnet. It's like this thing that all, every bit of trouble that's in the room comes flying at you when you have a character bent. So it, it happened every single time. I would do the four sessions, two offerings, partner call, ministering to thousands of people and all this other stuff. And I would, we would get back to the hotel room at like one o'clock in the morning. Our flight's at 5 a.m. We got to get up at three to pack and to go. And I would whip out the key and I, man, I grew, I would grow horns. And I would be like, I'm going down to the desk to get a clay key. To get. I'm going to go down and gore the desk assistant with my horns. It was bad. It was bad. And then I'd go out and minister. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Whatever. Oh, my God. It was, it was horrible. Now, I started to notice something <laughs> during this time, among many other things. I was gaining weight. Okay, like, I would fast on every trip. Because I knew I was fighting this. This is before I knew what it was, right? That it was a character band with a giant on it. And so I'm fasting. I'm like, I gotta break this thing off me, man. I'm so angry. I gotta break this thing off me, man. So I'd be fasting, starve myself to death. And then at the very end, I'd be like, I'm so hungry. We go to Denny's at like midnight, back, just stuffing food in my face. It's like, oh my gosh. But, you know, like if you fast that long and you have that much activity, you don't gain weight. I mean, if you gorge one night, whatever. But man, I was gaining weight. And, and I'd be like, wow, I'm so big. I would go home and I'd get on the scale. It's like, wow, I gained like six, seven pounds while I was fasting. How is that possible? I was starving myself to death and now I'm like six, seven pounds heavier. What's up? I could not figure it out. And then I, you know, I get on the treadmill. I only had like two days. I get home, unpack, wash my clothes, <laughs> run on the treadmill, for <laughs> trying to lose the weight so I could fit into my clothes, you know, get the clothes out, put them back in the suitcase and do it again. And it was almost like every single time I'd be on tour, it was like pull the rip cord, push, the life vest, the life raft. Push. I'm like, what is this guy? So... It multiplied and got even worse then. So then I was on tour and I'm going through this horrible circular battle. If you've been in through a circular battle, there's probably a character band behind it. And <laughs> I'm just saying. <sighs> and I'm in, the, I'm in the hotel room and I'm looking at myself in the mirror as I'm getting dressed and I go, what is that? God, I look. I had indentations inside my muscles in my legs. And my legs had like shrunk down to these itty bitty little sticks. And I was like, what is going on? My belly is doing this. My legs are doing this. And I look like an Ethiopian child. <laughs> what is going on? So I, I was so depressed. I got in the plane afterwards and I said, God, what is going on? He said, Numbers five. I was like, okay. So I went to Numbers 5. Let's read it. Okay, in this story, there's this thing called the curse of the bitter water. It was, it, if a man thought his woman was having an adulterous affair, he'd bring her to the priest, and she'd have to say an oath that she wasn't fooling around on him, and then uh, she would drink this mixture. He would make this concoction out of, you know, he'd put this dirt from the bottom of the tent into this jar, and then she had to drink it. 
It was the it was the bitter water that brings the curse. And if she was guilty, then the Bible says this that her belly would swell and her thigh would rot. Curse of the bitter water. Now, of course, I, I've never committed adultery on my husband. He's never committed adultery on me. But how many of you know you can commit adultery on the Lord by being angry or upset or bitter or depressed or whatever your character bent is because you're not trusting God? You're being controlled not by God or the Holy Spirit, but by this bent. And so because of it, my belly had swollen and my thigh had... I went home and I prayed in fierce and tongues. I was so, okay, now I'm on a mission because now I know what to do. So I go home and my, uh, my, I was so tired. My sister had said, you have a week off for a rare week. Go to my house and swim in the pool and stuff. So we did. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there. My husband's watching TV. I never w- watch TV, but we're watching TV because we're just trying to relax. And I'm on the couch going, <laughs> to get rid of this bent and to get rid of this weight and to grow my legs back. <laughs> My husband keeps looking at me because he's watching TV. And he would take the remote and go and turn up the volume. And I'd be like, He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm I'm trying to lose weight. And he goes, could you go lose weight somewhere else? After about a couple hours of that, it was my first weight loss miracle. And I, I just got, I just saw somebody mocking me on the line for this. So I hope you're watching. <laughs> but I had my hands on my belly and I'm like, Shut up, and I'm repenting for my character. Man. Shut up, and all of a sudden, literally, my hands went as my stomach dropped from underneath me and I lost six pounds. It just goes to prove it's real. Now, how is this connected to the giants? And, and by the way, three months late, in, within the next three months, my legs grew back. How is this connected to the giants? It says your belly will swell and your thigh will rot. Rot, rot, rot. You look it up. It's got inside the language as a prime root inside the language. And normally I'd have a board, but I don't have it ready tonight, today. Inside the language, the prime root of rot me is nafal, as in nephalim, as in giants, as in mighty men. So they're affecting your physical body too when you have these character bands. Don't even think it's not connected. They affect your physical body when, when you have these character bands. Don't even think it's not connected. They make your belly swell, your thigh rot, they bring disease, they bring cancer, they bring all kinds of issues, and they're over metal. I'm going to try to land the plane. Yeah, right. Okay. You know, um, historical things talk about how the giants taught men how to work metal, how to make weapons of metal. They didn't know how to make weapons of war before the giants arrived on the earth. And men taught them, these giants taught men, excuse me, how to make these metal weapons. Okay, so the giants use metal against us, including what's in your body. Now, where's proof that giants are over the metal? Go to Judges 5. Judges 4, we'll start there. Yeah. Deborah the prophetess, right? She sits under the palm of Deborah, judging. You know, thank you, Lord, for that scripture. For, that was for me, by the way. Um, they're fighting Sisera, the general of Jabin's army. Jabin has kept the Israelites under bondage for, I don't know, I think 20 years. Yes, 20 years, severe bondage. Okay, and uh, there's a, she receives a word, um, this is how you're going to defeat these guys, because nobody would, had been able to defeat Sisera because they had in their possession 900 iron chariots. Can you imagine that? Have you ever watched Forge with Fire? 
A friend of mine actually produces that. Okay, Forged with Fire, they go and these guys, they have an assignment, you gotta make a sword, you gotta make a this, you gotta make a dagger, and it takes these guys like a long time to, to make it. Okay, I mean, you sit there, they go in the forge and they take the metal and they forge it and they heat it up and they beat it and they do all this stuff. It takes like a couple different days to make, you know, one little sword. How much technology would you have to have in order to build 900 solid iron chariots? You'd have to have some major tech. Who taught them? Who taught them how to make the iron chariots? A giant. You know why? Because Cicero was a giant. How do we know? Because Deborah got a word, everybody go out to the Kishon River and we're gonna defeat them there. So they all come to meet. Here comes uh, Cicero with his 900 iron chariots and uh, the Kishon flooded. That's a whole nother teaching. I'll tell it one day. But it flooded and all the iron chariots got stuck in the mud. Yeah, so God overcame the metal weapons of the enemy, of the giant. So then the next verse, Deborah's singing a victory song. She's got her tambourine and she's going. And she's saying all these different things in this victory song. And as part of this victory song, she says this very interesting little, little tidbit here. She goes, um, that an angel came and said, curse Mayrose, said the messenger of the Lord, the angel, Curse bitterly, <laughs> oh God, its inhabitants, because they came not out to help the Lord and to help the Lord against the mighty. So as part of her victory song, she's prophetically singing that an angel came to curse a city called Meros because they didn't help when all of Israel rose up to come fight against Sisera and the 900 iron chariots. They didn't help, so they were cursed bitterly. I think it's because they were bitter people, and that's why they didn't help in the first place. And then she says this, they cursed them, that the angel said curse them because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord fight against the mighty, meaning Sisera with his 900 iron chariots was a mighty man. He had giant DNA in his bloodline and that's why he was able to build and have the technology to build 900 iron chariots. I hope you're catching my drift here. He was able, he was able to have the tech to take out to build 900 iron chairs because he was a mighty man, because he was a giant, because he had that in his DNA. This connects, this connects the giants with their ability to use metal as a weapon of war against God's people. That's why a lot of people, man, they have a lot of trouble with those metal implants. <laughs> because when the doctors put them in, they had a character bent inside their soul that of course the doctors know nothing about. That character bent attracts that giant spirit and it causes that giant to then bend the metal, cause pain in the metal, twist the metal, cause the metal to be infected and disable the metal from coming out. When people don't have their metal come out in a meeting, when I'm working metal miracles, it's because they have a character bent in them that hasn't been healed yet. I am able to work metal miracles because I've got, because I've been healed of my bends. Now they try to come back, let me tell you that, and I'm like, oh, nope, not gonna do it. Not gonna go there. But because I don't have anything in common, anymore it's why I'm able to work the metal because as I'm releasing the power and the angel and the Holy Spirit to remove the metal from people's bodies I'm also if you listen to me I'm commanding a spirit to come out guess who I'm addressing the giant that's behind the pain the giant that's twisting that metal did you hear what I said are you keeping up with me you act like you're in stage shock. <laughs> like Hiroshima, we just dropped a bomb. When you pray for somebody with metal, you should get rid of their trauma first, and then you should ask them, do you have any bents in your character? Let's repent of those. Did you hear me? All right, I'm way over time, so now I'm going to speed it up. Please put on Ephesians 3.16 up on the board. Did you catch that connection? I just gave you a secret that nobody else knows.
And let me tell you, those bands try to come back on me all the time. I succumbed to one for a second yesterday. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I back up. I repented that. You cannot come back because I'm going to have metal miracles tonight. And I did. I will not let myself be controlled by those again. Okay, now look. Here's part of the way we also get healed of these character bands. We apply the blood. We repent. But we also release a power called dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. Acts 1, 8 says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That word power is dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. Yes. The good thing about dunamis, there's so many good things about dunamis. It means the power to perform a miracle. But it also means this, excellent of soul. Say dunamis means excellent of soul. Yes. Why is that important? Because character bends live in your soul. Now look at this scripture. Ephesians 316, let's read it together. Ready? One, two, three. May he grant you out of the rich treasury of his glory to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit himself indwelling your innermost being and personality. See, here Paul is praying that you would be strengthened and reinforced with what? Mighty power. Guess what that is? Everybody say dunamis. Where? In your inner man. That's not your spirit. Your spirit don't need no help. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Your spirit's perfect. That word inner man there means your soul. Your soul. It says, so you're going to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power. That's dunamis, which means excellence of soul. Everybody say excellence of soul. In your where? Inner man, that's your soul. By the Holy Spirit. Remember, you'll receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. Holy Spirit's not a power. He's a person. But he brings power with him. So you get Holy Spirit. You get power. That word power is dunamis. It means excellent of soul. And God here, Paul is praying that you'll be strengthened and reinforced with that dunamis power in your soul. So you can become excellent soul. And it's the Holy Spirit that does it. Am I going too fast? Okay, now look, it says this, himself, the Holy Spirit himself indwelling your innermost being and personality, personality, personality. Your personality comes from your soul, man, right? You demonstrate, you know, I'm a joyous person, I'm a happy person, that's part of my personality. That comes from your soul, doesn't it? Right? But the negative character bents also live in your soul, and they represent your personality, too, in a bad way. That guy's such a negative person. That, that guy's so critical. That guy, that, that lady, she's always depressed. These are describing the character bends that are in our personality, right? But dunamis gets rid of it. Put your hand on your belly and your heart. Man, I'm, I'm going to pray for myself right now. I need it. Ready? Say, Lord God, I decree I'm being strengthened and reinforced with mighty dunamis power in my inner man, which is my soul, by the activity of the Holy Spirit himself indwelling my innermost being and my personality. Lord Jesus, I command the flow of dunamis power through the Holy Spirit to flood my personality. Go Holy Spirit, put dunamis power in every part of my personality that has a negative bent to it. Change the bent. Heal the bent. Remove the bent. Change my personality. Where I'm angry, have me be happy. Where I'm depressed, have me be joyful. Where I'm critical, have me demonstrate mercy. Where I am upset and frustrated, have me be content. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. Target every single character bent 
in my personality and crush it. Now pray in tongues. <laughs> Put your hand on your head. It's those thoughts that are controlling you too. Release the power into your brain. Come on, keep going. Come on, brain tongues, let me see your lips moving. Keep going. Get rid of it. Keep going. You gotta get rid of it. It's deep. Throw the stone at that giant. Come on. Fire, 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 fire. 
fire 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 repent your pride fire 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 Come on, push for one more minute. Shanalelelo, shanalelelo. Stand up. Shanalelelo, 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 shanalelelo. Push. Shanalelelo, 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 shanalelelo. Shandalelelo, 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 Shandalelelo. Come on, shout to God. Oh, oh, oh. Now turn to your neighbor. And I want you to start telling that spirit, to, that devil to come out. Go. Come out. Giant, 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 come out. Come out. Giant, come out. Giant, come out. I judge the giants. You come out. 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 Out, out, I fry you, out, 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 out in Jesus' name, out in Jesus' name. Out witchcraft, out idolatry, out witchcraft, out idolatry, out giant, out in Jesus' name, out in Jesus' name. Jesus. Now put your hands on your heart and say, now God fill me with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Kindness. Patience, gentleness, self-control, love, peace. Say, fill me with the fruit of the Spirit. Say, I am controlled by the fruit, not by a bent. I break my agreement with that giant. I break my agreement with that idolatry and witchcraft. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, now shout a big roar unto God. Go. Now, from this point on, 
When that character bent starts to come up, you catch it. And you say, oh, no, I will not submit to that giant. That's how you throw the stones at the giant. So I will not submit to you, giant. I'll cut your head off. I will not bow and be controlled by that giant bent. And you watch, you're going to see more miracles happen. Okay? Can you all say amen? Amen. Now, look, I could keep going forever, but we have to go and get ready to go up the mountain. I know everybody's going to run and ask me to pray for them. I can't do it right now. I'm so sorry. We have to go, and we have to get ready so we can go to our next event. Okay, but remember, I will be here thir- uh, Tuesday night and Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So if you want more, you come back, all right? All right, I love you.